Well, we have a very special video for you. I'm about to speak by Skype with Rafael Cruz. Rafael Cruz is Ted Cruz's dad. I think you are going to be super impressed with who Rafael is, what he has to say, and you'll be super interested as he talks about his son, Ted, his upbringing, all that right now. I am thrilled to have on the air with me Rafael Cruz, the father of Senator Ted Cruz, presidential candidate Ted Cruz, winner of the Iowa caucus, Ted Cruz. Rafael Cruz has a book, A Time for Action. It is a call to empowered Christians that they, we, must reignite the promise of America. Uh, Reverend Cruz, Rafael, great to have you on the broadcast with us today. Dr. Brown, it's so good. great to be with you. Always great to be with you. Well, thank you, sir. We met a few months back. You were speaking in North Carolina. Uh, we had lunch together. That's when you asked me to prayerfully consider endorsing your son. I had never endorsed a candidate, but I felt that this was the right time to do so. And, and you told me something very powerful about how the decision was made for him to run. What happened that the day, the, the day you gathered for prayer and decided that he should run for president? Well, actually, prior to that, my son Ted and his family spent six months in prayer, you know, seeking God's will for this decision. But the day that the, the final green light came on, the whole family was together. It was in a Sunday. We were all at his church, First, First Baptist Church in uh, Houston, Texas, including his senior staff. And after church service, we all gathered at the pastor's uh, office. We were on our knees for two hours seeking God's will. And, you know, at the end of that time, a word came through his wife, Heidi. And the word uh, came just saying, seek God's face, not God's hand. Mm. And I'll tell you, it was as if there was a cloud of the Holy Spirit filling that place. They, some of us were weeping and just Ted just looked up and said, Lord, here am I. Use me. I surrender to you, whatever you want. And it was uh, as he felt that that was a green light to move forward. Mm. So he is not, you know him better than any of us, he is not then what you would call a career politician, correct? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, he has been calling the problems in Washington, the corrupt career politicians in both parties, which he calls the Washington cartel. It is because of that that you see so many politicians in Washington that come against him because they want to continue the gravy train. They don't want anything to change because they are in bed with the lobbies and the powers that be. And Ted wants to restore America back to the fundamental Judeo-Christian and constitutional principles that have made America the greatest country on the face of the earth. And those that want to keep the status quo, don't want anything to change. Mm. Now, we've heard, uh, many of us have heard your story coming from Cuba, what you went through. When did Jesus come into your life and how has that impacted your life and then your son's life? Well, uh, unfortunately, I didn't come to the Lord until I was 36 years old. I, uh, because of that, I lived a fast life. I was drinking way too much because of my alcohol. You know, I, I, I had a, an oil exploration company, I was doing business in the bar, meeting mm. clients in the bar at lunch and then in the evening. And of course that took a toll on my family. And late in 1974, I left my wife and son and went to Houston. Uh, this was uh, December of 1974. And was there for about three months, three and a half months. And then a, a colleague of mine invited me to a Bible study at his home. Well, I was alone in Houston, didn't have anything to do, so I went. Michael, I don't even know what the Bible study was about. Mm. But after the Bible study, they had a time of prayer, and every one of them shared prayer requests. What impressed me is they all had problems. There was a woman that talked about living with her son and her son beating her to get money for drugs. And yet she had a peace. All of them had a peace that I couldn't understand. Is that peace that the Bible calls a, past, a peace that surpasses all understanding. I certainly didn't have it, and I certainly wanted it. Mm. Well, as I, I left that Bible study, the lady of the house said, gave me a little booklet, The Four Spiritual Laws, and said, listen, why don't you read this little booklet, and could you come next week? 
So I went the next Monday. She asked me, what did you think of the booklet? Did you read it? And I said, yes, I read it, but it can't be that easy. <laughs> well, she didn't know how to answer me. They were new Christians. And instead of referring me to the man who led the Bible study, she said, listen, our pastor is going to be at our home tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Would you come? So I went the next evening, and I'll tell you, I was a scientist. I spent, Michael, four hours arguing with this pastor. I mean, I was just sure that I could just tear down all his excuses and, and tell him that all this Christianity was, was a bunch of hocus pocus. Well, about 11 o'clock at night, and I just praised God that this man would not give up on me. After four hours of arguing, the last thing I asked this man is, well, let me ask you, Pastor Wiley, what about that man up in the mountains of Tibet who's never heard of Jesus? Well, very wisely, this pastor did not take that bait. Instead of chasing that rabbit, he looked me at the eye and he said, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't know about that man up in the mountains of Tibet who's never heard of Jesus, but you heard of Jesus. What's your excuse? Mm. You know, Michael, that statement just hit me like a sledgehammer. All of a sudden, the eyes of my understanding were opening, and I just fell on my face, surrendered my life to Christ, and that revolutionized my life. The next weekend, I was baptized, and right after that, I got on a plane, went back to my wife and son, and asked my wife to forgive me. Well, she wasn't a Christian. She really didn't un understand or believe but she didn't want to raise our son Ted without a father, so she agreed for us to get together again. We moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, actually the first, the next first, next two or three years were very difficult because I basically was devouring the book, devouring the Bible, but not paying much attention to my wife. Uh, I was at, at the church every time they had a meeting by myself. I only took my wife and son to church on Sunday, but the rest of the week I was in men's meetings and prayer meetings and visitations. My wife said, you traded the bar for the church, mm. and she still felt alone. Uh, praise God, I didn't do the same thing with my son. I began pouring the Word of God into my son. Well, after a couple of years, my wife received the Lord while watching a Christian television program. Our communication was so poor, it took two weeks for her to tell me. <laughs> but then when Ted was eight years old, I have to, after I had been pouring the Word of God into him every night for four years, he surrendered his life to Christ when he was eight years old. And I'll tell you, I am so, so grateful that the Lord put me in front of that pastor that wouldn't give up on me and spend four hours so lovingly sharing the Word of God with me and the love of Jesus Christ with me. One thing I know from the time that we spent together, Raphael, your heart burns for Jesus, your heart burns for the church, and your heart burns for the nation. And as I've had the privilege of spending some time with your son and, and hearing him share about the Lord's work in his life, I, I have no question that he's the real deal in terms of he is in this because he loves God and he loves America and he believes he can make a difference. There are some charges that have come against him. There's controversy. I want you to tell our listeners, as you know Ted Cruz better than any of us, who this man really is. Rafael Cruz has a new book out, A Time for Action. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I am speaking with Rafael Cruz. You may know him as the father of Ted Cruz, presidential candidate and Senator Ted Cruz. Rafael has written a book, A Time for Action. Rafael is a man of God and a man of action. And Ted Cruz was criticized for saying, I'm a Christian first, I'm an American second, I'm a conservative third, but I can't think of any Christian who really is serious about his or her faith saying that they're an American first and a Christian second. Well, recently, Senator Cruz has come under attack as a Christian. Is he a man of integrity? Is he a liar? Is he nasty? Can he be trusted? So I have the privilege of speaking to Rafael Cruz in the midst of all the craziness of the campaign Raphael, tell my listeners who your son really is. You, you've known him his entire life. You've watched his marriage with his wife, Heidi. You know him behind the scenes when no one else is watching. Who is this man really, and what makes him tick? Well, as I was telling you a little earlier, I began pouring the Word of God into him when he was four years old, and he surrendered his life to Christ when he was eight. 
But politically, I tell you, he got his first uh, impact in the political arena when he was nine. I was very involved with an organization called the Religious Roundtable. It was a Judeo-Christian organization that mobilized millions of people of faith to help elect whom I considered the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln, President Ronald Reagan. Every day at our dinner table, our conversation was about why we had to get rid of this progressive socialist Jimmy Carter and replace him with a constitutional conservative like Ronald Reagan. So my son Ted got a dose of conservative politics from a Christian worldview every day for a year mm. when he was nine years old. Wow. But the real impact on his life was when he was 13. As he was entering high school, we introduced him to an organization called the Free Enterprise Institute. So now Ted is reading Adam Smith and John Locke and Von Mises and Hayek and Bastiak and Milton Friedman and the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Then this organization creates a group of five kids. They call them the Constitutional Corroborators. They hired a memory expert and they taught these five kids, my son Ted was one of the five, to memorize the U.S. Constitution. For the next four years, my son Ted gave approximately 80 speeches on free market economics and the Constitution. Before my son Ted left high school, he was passionate about the Constitution. He was passionate about the Declaration, about free markets, about limited government, about the rule of law. And that passion became like fire in his bones. And you know, Michael, the reason I know my son Ted Cruz will not compromise his principles in Washington is that fire is as alive today as it was over 30 years ago. My son is a man of truth. He's a man of integrity. He's a man you can trust. Two things you can trust with Ted Cruz. Number one, he will tell you the truth. And number two, he will do exactly what he says he's going to do. He has done that 100% of the time. What you see is what you get. And I'll tell you what, he has a true servant spirit. He realizes that as a public uh, servant, he is a servant of we the people. He wants to go to the Oval Office to be the servant to every American and to open up the opportunity for every American to achieve their American dream, not only for themselves, but for their children and their children's children. Yeah. And listen, as I've spent time with you, heard your heart, the prayer that went into him even saying he was going to run for office, and then the time that I've heard him, the times I've spoke with him face to face, what became immediately clear to me was he's not in this for politics or for political gain. There, I'm sure there are other candidates with deep conviction as well, but that what was, was clear to me that he really believed that America's in a mess and that he wanted to give himself to make a difference. All right, we come back, I've got one more opportunity to speak with Rafael Cruz, his new book, A Time for Action. When we come back, I wanna ask Rafael Cruz, hey, what about the role of the church in America? Are we talking about a theocracy? Are we talking about taking over? What's the role of the church? And what could a godly president do to bring about change? My guest, Rafael Cruz, his book, A Time for Action. I am speaking with Rafael Cruz, the father of presidential candidate and Senator Ted Cruz. Rafael and I met some months back, and it was Rafael who asked me to pray about endorsing Ted Cruz. And, and I said, listen, I, I have two essentials, two things that are non-negotiable to me. Number one, the person must be an impeccable moral conservative. They've got to be a moral conservative on issues of life and family. They've got to be a strong friend of Israel. Obviously, they have to be competent in all these other areas, but that's where I start. And secondly, they have to be willing to take on the establishment because no, no matter who the candidate is, I was convinced that no matter what, how good a candidate they were, if they wouldn't take on the Republican and Democratic establishment, they, they will not be able to bring about change. The more I heard about Ted Cruz, the more I was convinced he was in my top two or three, the more I was convinced he could be a person to do it. Hence my personal endorsement. On the radio show, we'll cover all issues fairly from every angle, but my personal endorsement was for Senator Ted Cruz, and that's why I said, yes, let's do it. And the more I spoke with Raphael, the more I heard his heart burning as well. Raphael, you told me a story about your son running for Senate in Texas. It, it didn't look like he had a chance at that time, and yet things happened quite astonishingly. What happened in Texas, and what makes you think they could happen nationally today? Well, you know, when Ted started to run for Senate, 
he was at two percent in the polls. He was running against the lieutenant governor of Texas, who had been in, in office for 12 years. This man, very, very wealthy. He spent $35 million of attack ads against my son, Ted. 22 of those 35 millions came from his own pocket. But I'll tell you what Ted had. He created a grassroots of tens of thousands of volunteers, tens of thousands of people across the state that were going door to door. He was speaking to tea parties and uh, 912 groups and uh, homeschoolers and constitutional conservatives. And everywhere it was a grassroots campaign. And I'll tell you what, the more he talked to people and the more that his message got out, the more people uh, came behind him. And he, in spite of this so well-known man that was running against him, he won that nomination by 14 percent. And he won the general by 16 percent. What, what about the notion, though, that he's too conservative to be elected uh, by the Americans, that he could potentially win the Republican nomination. He's got the great ground game. He's got a good history as a committed conservative, et cetera. But there's no way he could win a national election. What do you say to that? Well, I, I'll tell you what. Those who think that way, they don't understand our history. Look at our history over the last 40 years. Every time we've had a middle-of-the-road, mushy moderate that has been running against the Democrats, we have lost. Mm -hmm. The thing that Ronald Reagan said, don't paint in, in, in pale colors, paint in bold colors, not pale pastels. You know, they despise Ronald Reagan, and they said the same thing about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is unelectable. He's a right-wing zealot. Well, Ronald Reagan not only won, he won by an overwhelming sweep both times. 44 states voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980, 49 states voted for Ronald Reagan in 1984. The same thing is going to happen with Ted. We are seeing the Reagan coalition being put back. Conservatives, constitutional conservatives, Tea Party groups, uh, homeschoolers, uh, all classes, including Reagan Democrats, they are coming together behind Ted Cruz. He's truly putting together a coalition, libertarians, uh, not only men, women, African-Americans, Hispanics, it's all coming together because people want to have a voice. People want a president that will be a president to every American, not a divide and conquer like you see with the Democratic Party. And people that want to not fundamentally destroy America, but restore America to the Judeo-Christian principles, to the constitutional principles that have made America the most unique country in the, on the face of the earth. And we can do that. We did it in 1980 by mobilizing people of faith. We can do it again, Michael. And I think we're going to see that happen. All right. Someone would say, a, a critic would say, it sounds like you're, you're advocating a theocracy. It sounds like you're talking about Christians taking over and imposing their religion on America. I know that's not what you believe. I know that's not what your son believes. So what's the difference between what you're saying and imposing some kind of theocracy? Well, we're not talking about a theocracy. We're talking about people who have been the, the background of America, the moral fiber of America, have been divorced from the political process. We have had over 50 percent of evangelicals not even voting. So you have a large percentage of the population that have been absent for the political process. All we are saying is we need everyone that has a desire to see America restored to become involved. Because if you're not involved, you don't even have a chance. You don't even, even have the right to complain. You become part of the problem instead of part of the solution. We are talking about restoring America back to the foundations. The Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Our, our foundations have been eroded by secular humanism, by just, like you were saying earlier, by just uh, destroying uh, the family, by basically the moral values that have made America great have been practically destroyed, and we are, have secularized America, and the new religion of America is secular humanism. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, for example, with Common Core, 
if we're seeing our children being brainwashed, not only with secular humanism, but with socialism, values clarification, situational ethics, where there are no moral values. And so that has caused a great deterioration of our moral fiber, of the foundations that have made America great. We need to go back to those principles that we know work, which is why America has been the bastion of freedom throughout the world for 200 years. We need to restore that, that foundation. And, and what do you feel a godly president could, could do? If, if your son was elected with his deep faith, his wife Heidi, her deep faith, their deep moral convictions, obviously we're not electing him as a, a pastor or a priest or a pope, but what effect could a godly leader, a godly president have on America in your view? Well, I think it, it boils down to this, character, integrity, trust. Those are the fundamental values that we want to portray. We better have someone we can trust. We have had too many politicians that lie all the time. Uh, and so nobody can trust someone that lies constantly. We need to have a man of trust, someone that you can believe that when they say something, they are going to do what they say. This is why I encourage people to don't listen to the rhetoric. Look at the record. Don't listen to what candidates say because they will say what you want to hear. Instead of look at what they do and what they have done. You know, Michael, Jesus put it this way. You shall know them by their fruits. It's about time we do some fruit checking. Mm. Look at the record. Ted's record is impeccable. Only 100% of the time, he has done exactly what he promised his constituents he was going to do. You can trust that he will do what he promised America he will do. And as I said, it boils down to character, integrity. We need to bring integrity back to the Oval Office, that, that we can again be respected across the world. We need for Americans to have the the feeling that they are giving their children a better America that they inherited. Right now, over 60% of Americans feel that their children are going to inherit a worse country than they had. That is unacceptable. We need to have every American feel the hope that they can achieve their dreams, not feel that, you know, things are on a down spiral. We can reverse that if we have someone whose interest is to serve we the people instead of self-serving. I think that's what you will get on a President Ted Cruz, someone who deeply cares for every America and who is a true servant of we the people. Uh, Rafael, I, I appreciate your, your words, your heart, your passion. Rafael's new book, A Time for Action, Empowered Christians Must Reignite the Promise of America. Uh, and Raphael, I know above all, you're praying and you're lifting up Jesus. And I know you'd like everyone to be praying for, for Ted and Heidi and the kids. So let's be sure we do that. And let's pray. We can agree on this. God, your best for America. And God, Amen. bring your church to repentance. Raphael, it's a joy to speak with you again. I look forward to seeing you face to face one of these days. Well, I am sure we'll see each other in the next couple of weeks because I'm coming to South Carolina and I'm sure I'll come up to North Carolina. Perhaps we can visit and maybe break some bread together, my brother. I, I will so, go out of my way to make it happen with joy. It'll be a privilege. Look forward to it. God bless God you. God bless you. God bless each and every one of your listeners.